Today we're at the Feltus Mounds in Jefferson County, Mississippi, uh, where I and a crew of students have been excavating for the past five weeks. What I'd like to do today is show you a little bit about what we've learned in these mounds, uh, what we've learned about their history, how they were built, and how they were used. Now the mound we're on now is called Mound A. It's the largest mound at Feltus. Originally there were four mounds here arranged on the cardinal points around an open area that we call a plaza. Um, and each of these mounds was built uh, in layers in distinct stages of construction where massive amounts of earth and fill were brought in uh, to build um, these mounds. Uh, and on top of each of these mounds was a flat summit where either a building stood or other activities took place. So imagine each of these mounds as being like a layer cake. Uh, and what we want to do is figure out how many layers there are and uh, when each of those layers was built. The simplest way to do that archaeologically is to cut a very narrow trench into the side of the mound. Uh, it's like cutting open a layer cake by cutting out a small slice. And when you look at the inside of that slice, you can see each of the layers. You can see how big the layers are. And you can also see how the layers were built. Now, the first thing I should explain is that um, we've excavated here in previous years. So where I'm standing is not the original surface but we're already a good uh, two meters or more than six feet above the original surface. Um, and we found the original surface on which this mound was built in our excavations here in 2006. Uh, this year, in, in 2012, we've continued the excavations upward in the trench to see what the upper layers of this mound look like. And so let me show you the layers that we found. Uh, in this profile near the base of the excavation, uh, you see this uh, line, this, this very narrow line of dark soil capped by light-colored soil. Um, this is the first surface on top of the first stage of construction. So um, we know that this construction took place uh, after 900 A.D., sometime in the 10th century A.D. And this surface is a very thin, prepared surface. Uh, we find a thin layer of charcoal on it. Uh, there were clearly fires on this surface. There may have been a building on this surface, but we haven't yet found any evidence of the building. But we know that this first layer of construction was about two meters high, probably close to about seven feet high. Then, uh, later in time, another layer of fill was added that starts here and goes up to here. Um, the second stage of construction uh, had another mound surface, and from this surface was dug a pit that you see the outlines of in the wall. Uh, this looks like a cooking pit or barbecue pit. You see that the walls of the pit are, are fire red and this orange soil um, is created by heat. And so you've got orange soil or fired soil all around the edges of this pit. And then in the bottom of the pit is a thick layer of ash, charcoal, that was probably used in the cooking. And then above that charcoal is another layer of burned earth. So it looks like they reused this pit multiple times. They had a layer of charcoal from one event and then they put a, a, a cap over that layer of charcoal and had another cooking event above that. And then at some point in time, the walls of this pit collapsed in, uh, filling it up. And so you see these, uh, these orange globs are actually originally from the wall that fell in. And then after this pit, sometime after this pit was abandoned and this cooking event took place, yet another layer of construction took place. And, and this layer went all the way to the top of the mound. Um, and we know this not only from what we found in this profile, but in an earlier season of excavation, uh, we dug another unit that comes right down from the top of the mound. And it overlaps with this profile, and there's just no floors between here and the top of the mound. So we know that the third stage of construction went all the way up to the top. So when we get back to the lab, we'll, we'll um, do analysis of the artifact we found. We found a lot of pottery and animal bone in this mound. Um, we'll get a sense of what kind of activities took place on this mound, and we'll also be able to get dates that will tell us when the subsequent stages, the stages after the first stage of construction, were built. We suspect that most of this construction was completed by about 1100 AD. So this is a mound that's about a thousand years old. The reason we know that this is constructional fill is because of the nature of the soil in it. Natural soil profiles tend to have soils of a single color or, or a set of different colors that grade gradually as you go from the top to the bottom of the soil profile. 
But what you see in this mound is a crazy quilt of colors. It's almost like the fur of a calico cat. Many different colors jumbled together. So you have bands uh, of yellow soil, capped by brown soil, capped by black soil. And the way you get this, um, this crazy quilt of colors is when people bring basket loads of earth from many different places and pile them in one place to create a mound. So this, this multicolored, stripy soil is very, very characteristic of artificial fill. And that's how we know that this mound was built artificially, that it was built by people, and it is not a natural formation. We're now at Mount C at the Feltus Mounds, uh, one of the three mounds is still standing, and this is the smallest of the remaining mounds. This one stands about four meters high, which is probably about 15 feet high in English units. Um, we also did an excavation here, and um, in this excavation, we went from the surface of the mound, again, we're digging on the edge so that we can see the layering, and uh, in this case, we went all the way down to the original surface. And one of the things we do after we finish an excavation like this is we very carefully draw and map all of the soil layers that are visible in the profile. And one of our students is now down there doing that. Um, we use these, these strings that are uh, placed level along the profile as our reference points for mapping. And, and then we very carefully plot in and draw in all the different soil layers. And again, these soil layers tell a story. They tell a story of the history of the mount. So at the very bottom of the unit, you see a black layer that is the original ground surface. That is the surface on which the mound was built. Above it is a layer of light gray and white wash that is wa soil that is washing down from what is probably an early mound stage that is just beyond the limits of our excavation. This wash is, is loaded with pottery and animal bone, all the, the refuse from the activities that were connected with this early mound stage. Then above that is about uh, two meters or a meter and a half of earthen fill, fill that has been brought in from elsewhere and piled up to, to make the mound even bigger. And at the very top of that black layer of fill is the first stage of mound construction. That's the, the top surface of the, of the first mound stage that we can actually see. There's probably an earlier stage that's buried uh, that was just out of sight beyond the mound profile. So this uh, surface was used for a while, and then yet another layer of fill was added. And this ends right here at the top of the brown. Um, and then the final stage of construction is this gray clay that had to have been brought in from down in the bottoms, which is quite a walk from where the mound was built. So all in all, we can see uh, three stages of construction in this profile. And we suspect that the earliest stage, the fourth stage, is, is buried just beyond the profile based on the wash that we see coming out uh, on top of the original surface. One of the interesting things about Mount C is that it's the only mound at this site um, and one of the few mounds in this area that is surrounded by a ditch that was dug by the Indians. Um, this ditch is still very well preserved um, and, and uh, surrounds the mound on three sides. It probably went all the way around the mound originally, but on the fourth side of the mound that we can't see here, there's a modern road that probably filled in the ditch and obliterated it. When we first saw this ditch, we thought it was an old road or maybe uh, the remnant of a stock pond, but now that we've mapped it in detail, it clearly follows the contours of the mound all the way around. Uh, it makes no sense as a road. It makes no sense as a stock pond, um, but it's, and it's clearly associated with the original construction of this mound. Now the Feltis site covers just under 20 acres, and originally there were four mounds here, one at the north end of the field, one at the east end, one at the west end, and one at the south end. Uh, of those original four mounds, three are still standing, but the fourth mound, the one that stood at the southern end of the field, uh, disappeared sometime between 1935 and 1947. Uh, we know it was here from earlier descriptions. And uh, an archaeologist named Warren King Moorhead came here in 1924 and actually excavated in this mound. So we know a little bit about uh, its size and, and, and shape and so forth. And uh, we came back to see if we could find evidence of this mound. And we, we pretty much established that it was entirely destroyed. Um, and there's really no trace of this, this mound left. Uh, right now I'm standing in the exact center of where Mound D, this fourth mound, once stood. 
and we know that this is the center of the mound because Mississippi's first state geologist, Benjamin L.C. Wales, came to this site in 1852 and made a very detailed map uh, from which we can now extrapolate the, the location of Mound D, and that's, that's where I'm standing now. Now, uh, we dug here in 2010 looking for any trace of Mound D that may have been left and didn't find any, but we found something else that was very interesting instead. Uh, right next to where Mound D stood, we found a massive borrow pit, a massive pit that had been dug by the Indians, uh, perhaps to create a pond, perhaps to get fill for building the mound, um, and then later they refilled it, and, and this pit is massive. Uh, we know from uh, tracing its outlines with an auger that it was about 20 meters wide from north to south and about 60 meters long from east to west, and, and at its deepest point it was about 3 meters or 10 feet deep. We finished excavating this unit uh, about two weeks ago and just finished mapping it, which you can see from these strings that we have along the walls that, are, that help us in mapping. Um, but I can show you the layers uh, in this trench that, that essentially tell us the history of this borrow pit. Uh, the bottom edge of the pit, you can see it diving down. Uh, this is the, the edge of the hole that was cut into the soil. Um, and it, again, it goes uh, to a total depth of about 10 feet at its deepest point. Then above the bottom edge of this unit, you can see a layer of gray and black refuse. This is refuse that um, came from the edge of the pit as people sort of threw refuse into this pit while it was open. And this refuse is very rich um, in animal bone and pottery. You can see pieces of cooking pots sticking out of the profile. We found lots and lots of animal bone, including deer, deer bone and bear bone, that came um, out of this refuse deposit at the bottom of the borrow pit. And then at some point uh, in its history, sometime in the 11th century AD, we know this from a radiocarbon date that we got uh, on deer bone in this uh, refuse deposit, sometime in the 11th century AD, the decision was made to refill this pit. And so we have this massive layer of constructional fill that starts at the bottom on top of the refuse layer and goes all the way to the top. Uh, we found this borrow pit entirely by accident when we were looking for the remnants of Mound D. Instead of finding fill going upward as we would in a mound, in one or two of our units we found fill going downward and as we caught the edge of this big borrow pit. Uh, and since then we've traced its size and, and again learned more of its history. Um, from excavating it. Another thing that we found in the vicinity of Mound D that may actually be earlier than the mound is this large refuse filled pit that was dug and refilled uh, probably in the 8th century AD, sometime around 780 AD. We know this from radiocarbon dates that we've gotten on charred cane from uh, one of the pits in this area. Um, these pits were dug uh, probably to get constructional material or possibly um, for uh, cooking or other purposes, and then later were refilled with refuse. Um, the refuse has been completely dug out, so what you see right now is just the outline of the original pit. So this large bowl-shaped depression uh, was the outline of the original pit. We've already taken all of the refuse out. Again, lots of animal bone, lots of pottery. Um, and then this trench dug through the center shows us a, an outline of a portion of this pit that goes even deeper than this bowl, and it may actually be an earlier pit that this later pit was dug into. So once we finish um, excavating, we always do careful mapping, and that's exactly what's going on now. The, the, the profiles of this unit are being mapped so we can see ex the exact outline of this earlier pit and see its relationship to the pit that we excavated uh, right next to me. I'm now headed to Mound B at Feltus. This is where we've done most of our work this summer. And again, like the other mounds, this one was built in stages. We know that there were at least five stages of construction on this mound, and, and these stages are separated by floors on which buildings once stood. Our goal in this summer's excavation was to get down to the uppermost uh, floor that's well preserved and to get a glimpse at the building that was on top. And we, we found that this building um, was originally burned just before the final stage of construction was added. So let's go on top and take a look.
Now Mound B is the second tallest mound at the site. It's six meters tall, which is just a meter shorter than Mound A. Um, and this mound um, has a number of building levels, and we're right now coming down on the uppermost of those levels. And in fact, we've just gone through that floor and are looking under, just under the, the floor, to see if we can find evidence of posts that would have been part of walls that would have formed buildings on top. So we're clean, very carefully cleaning this surface, looking for evidence of post holes. Um, we found in the layer just above this a burned post that was still vertical, um, and that where and it burned just before the final stage of fill was added. We know that because where the fill came in contact with the post, uh, it was reddened by heat. So um, right here. Um, we don't see any evidence of post holes, uh, which would appear as round, sort of dark stains. Right now we're cleaning off the layer just below the, f the original floor of the mound. That is, this is the, 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 the floor of the summit um, of the fourth stage of construction that was filled that, or covered by the fifth and last stage of construction. Uh, this summit had a burn, burned building on top of it. We've gone below the layer of burning, and now we're looking for stains in the soil that would indicate where the posts uh, might have, wooden posts may have stood that were part of the walls of this building. One of those wooden posts uh, we found charred intact. In fact, you can see it down there, or at least a remnant of it. Um, where you see that cave in the wall, uh, you can see remnants of charcoal in, that are stuck in the wall. Though That's the side of the post that still remains in the wall. We took the post out in order to give ourselves room to work. And underneath that charred post was just an open area, kind of a hole in the soil. We think that formed um, because wood preserves for a thousand years only if it's been charred. If it hasn't been charred, then it will decay away. So we think the top of the post was charred, and that's the part we found, whereas the lower part of the post wasn't charred, and that decayed away, leaving the hole underneath. Now, where he's troweling and where he's cleaning, you see a, a, a kind of a circular, a roughly circular stain. That is the outline of where the original post once stood, where it was planted in the soil. So by looking for alignments of wooden posts that are evidenced by these stains in the soil, uh, we can identify walls. And so we think we have a portion of a wall right here where he's troweling, and then we're looking for the opposite wall the, the, on the other side of the building that would be farther north in this trench. So here we have a line of three post holes. Each of these is a stain in the soil that is left behind where a wooden post once stood. Where you have a line of, of post holes, you had a line of posts, and usually a line of posts indicates a wall, like the wall of a building that may have stood atop this mound. The post hole closest to me, uh, right beneath where I'm standing, has white clay in it, which suggests that um, the wall of which this post was a part may have been plastered with white clay. So at the base of this trench, in the profile, you can see a, a dark band of soil. That dark band is a cross-section of the surface of the mound that we've just come down to. Um, usually dark soil is indicative of an organic rich layer that develops where people conduct activities. Um, and, and the top of that uh, black layer is burned in many places where you can see uh, orange soil on top. Um, and at the far end, you can see the burning is fairly extensive. There was clearly a, a big episode of burning on the top of this mound, sometime just before it was covered with fill. And what we believe may have happened in a lot of cases is that buildings stood atop these mounds. And before the next layer of construction was built, was put on top, uh, the building itself was decommissioned, and burning the building may well have been part of that decommissioning process. The reason we're digging here is we really want to find out uh, what the nature of the buildings on top of these mounds were. In other words, what they were used for. Were they the residences of chiefs, or were they community buildings like temples uh, or meeting places? Um, in this period, we simply don't know how the buildings on top of the mounds were used, and this is something we hope to find out from the evidence that we collect in this excavation. Uh, one of the best lines of evidence we have, and it hasn't yet been analyzed, uh, is the refuse that was generated by the activities on this surface. The floor itself, where the building stood, is, is very, very clean. But um, on the far end of the trench, where the mound slopes down, where the top of the mound slopes down, 
there's a big pile of refuse. We call that a flank midden. Uh, a midden is a refuse pile, and, and it's called a flank midden because the people who lived on top of this mound or who did activities on top of this mound would toss or sweep the refuse over the edge. So it's just over the edge where we find the biggest concentration of broken pottery and of animal bone. And we have extraordinary preservation of bone uh, in that area. We have the remains of deer. We have the remains of bear. Um, we have all sorts of other aquatic animals and fish that we haven't yet identified. Um, and when we look at um, the nature of that refuse, the types of pottery vessels, the size of the pottery vessels, the kinds of food that are being consumed up on top of this mound, that should give us um, some very valuable clues about how the buildings on top of this mound stage were used.